Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. Today we're gonna to talk about the birth of the GNL ASAT and Broadcaster and how it all kind of took place because a guitar player really, 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 really pissed off Leo Fender and how his comments and then also the comments from dealers caused Leo Fender to revisit his design work and to combine innovation also with a nod to his own past. And that really comes together in the broadcaster and ASAT. And so we're gonna talk about where those two things meet together. And we're gonna tell the story of how all these things took place, of how, how he got so mad. And uh, it's, it's a good one. It's got a lot of interesting characters. We're gonna talk about uh, also this specific ASAT which uh, this is an early one. You can tell by the logo and the string tree on there. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is one that was played by a famous guitar player on Austin City Limits and influenced another famous guitar player. And uh, I'm going to tell that story and how uh, this uh, instrument changed hands. So it's going to be a good one. Before we dive in, I've got to say thank you to my Patreon supporters, Thank you so much. If you want to support the show, that's the best way. There's a link in the description and you can check it out. All right, let's go. So, of course, we'll just give the nickel version of the Leo Fender story. Of course, he starts Fender you know, in the mid-1940s. He sells the company in January of 1965. He consults with Fender for a couple of years. Uh, then he has a non-compete clause. Then he starts working with Music Man, mainly on basses and guitars. The relationship sours, and he begins making GNL guitars and basses, which, of course, the GNL stands for George and Leo, uh, as in George Fullerton, who was another longtime Fender employee. So that kind of sets the stage, and the year is 1981, and GNL is really trying to get their instruments out there. And at that point, they are making guitars and basses that feature active electronics and a lot of switches and knobs. And this is kind of a continuation of the things that Leo did while designing and building instruments for Music Man. And these things went over well with bass players because they liked active electronics. They liked extended frequency range, higher highs and lower lows, and fast attack and crispness and things like that. But guitar players didn't like them. And those Music Man sabers, and again, we're talking about 70s Music Man. We're not talking, this is nothing about Ernie Ball Music Man, the current, the uh, 1984 and forward uh, Music Man company. Um, yeah, those guitars didn't really go over well. And so the relationship with Music Man has soured. GNL is making instruments on their own, and they're, they're trying to move forward with these similar type instruments, but under the GNL name. So their playbook, as far as promoting instruments, had always been the same. Find hot young players. Uh, especially who are on either radio or later on television. So one of the guys at GNL found out about a music related show that was being shot at a nearby club and the guy at GNL knew the bass player, contacted the bass player and said, Hey, I know y'all are filming a pilot for this kind of music show. Can we bring some GNL instruments down for y'all to play? You know, here it is, you know, great way to promote uh, GNL guitars, put them on TV. Well, Leo and his wife, Phyllis, and uh, George Fullerton and his wife, and Dale Hyatt and his wife, they all go down to, the, to this bar where they're going to film the show, and they've got instruments there, and they're all proud, and they're all, you know, having a nice evening, and the band shows up and they begin playing. The bass player is fine, but the guitar player picks up the uh, GNL guitar with all the switches and knobs and active electronics, and he doesn't like it. And he's having a hard time. 
just to add some interest to the story, the, uh, the singer in the band is Barbie Benton, who, if you're familiar with, uh, you know, I guess, Playboy history and such, then you know that uh, Barbie Benton was a playmate and also the longtime girlfriend of Hugh Hefner. So she's singing in the band, and they're filming, and the guitarist, his name is Jeff Ross. Jeff Ross is having a horrible time because he's not using his guitar, and he's using an instrument that he's having a hard time trying to get a good sound out of. So he's really frustrated. So they take a break in filming. He gets down from the bandstand, and as he passes the table where... Leo and his wife and all the other GNL bigwigs are with their wives. One of them says, "Hey, what do you think of the GNL guitar?" Well, Jeff Ross was in a moment of uh, great frustration and uh, blunt honesty, and he turns to them and says, "That is the worst guitar I've ever played in my life." Well, of course, the whole table, their their mouths, you know, kind of hang open and and they're just in shock. And Leo says, well, what did you not like about it? And Jeff begins to enumerate the things that he didn't like about the guitar, which include the active electronics and the and the the complicated switching and the 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 knobs and and switches and everything. And you know, Leo begins kind of arguing with him. And then Jeff, without knowing it, delivers the greatest insult that you could give to Leo Fender at that time period. So Leo uh, considered himself a great innovator, which he absolutely was. Think about Fender amplifiers, the electric bass, the Telecaster, the Stratocaster, the Jazzmaster, the Jaguar, the basics, on and on and on. All these amazing things that Leo had designed in a in less than two decades. And Leo wanted to continue to innovate. He had no desire to do anything that he had done in the past. So Jeff Ross unknowingly said the greatest insult. He said, why don't you make something like you did in the late 40s and early 50s? And that caused Leo to go beat red and begin to argue and the veins in his head are popping out and some ugly things go back and forth and Jeff Ross, Jeff Ross walks away. He goes over to the bar and George Fullerton comes up and kind of puts his arm around him in a fatherly way and says, you know, we understand what you're saying. We understand your, your frustration with the guitar. And, and, and that's that. And Jeff Ross goes on and he goes back to, uh, you know, to gigging and doing what he's always done. Well, Leo Fender goes back to the GNL offices and or CLF, you know, research. And he's just, he can't let go. And he keeps walking around saying, who does that Jeff Ross fellow think he is? How could he say that to me? How could he talk about my guitar this way? And this goes on for months. Leo Fender is not letting it go. He is mad as hell at Jeff Ross. Well, the guitar starts being shown to dealers. And the dealers start coming back with similar comments. And it's at that point that Leo can't just... Throw, throw it all on Jeff Ross. Now he knows he has a real problem and that he must do something different. So he decides, he decides to design a more traditional instrument. And this instrument eventually becomes the SC2, which in really what it is, is the ASAT in everything but body shape. So it has the MFD pickups, it has the neck design, it has the Loctite bridge, it has everything of what we think of on the ASAT or the Broadcaster. So he takes the prototype for this guitar and he wires it up and they find out where Jeff Ross is playing next and they ambush him. 
<laughs> well, maybe not ambush him, but they just show up at the gig unannounced, you know, before the gig starts. So Jeff Ross shows up to load in, and there's Leo Fender, Dale Hyatt, and George Fullerton, this time without their wives, and they've got a black guitar case. And they open it up, and there's the SC2, kind of the prototype for it. And uh, the only thing that's different on it than uh, the, the production models is it has a little mini toggle switch that adds sparkle when you hit it. And so it kind of cuts bass and adds, uh, it really, I guess it really just cuts bass. And so you can use it, you know, you can kind of dial in your bridge pickup sound and then you can go to the neck and you can hit that little switch and it'll give you a nice sparkly uh, neck pickup sound. But it's simple, you know, it's got these two pickups, Two, you know, it's got a volume and tone control, it's got a three-way switch, and it just has this little mini toggle switch, it has the Loctite bridge and everything. And Jeff plays it, and he plays it that night, and he's very happy with it. He continues to gig with it. He calls Leo Fender and tells him how much he's continued to love it and play it, and it's just been a great guitar. And Leo Fender says, that's great, we're going to go into production with it. He says, I need the guitar back. We're going to run it through the bandsaw. And Jeff says, what? He said, yeah, uh, Leo apparently really felt burnt by people keeping prototypes and such from the Fender days and that then those instruments would be sold for large sums of money. And so he didn't want any prototypes floating around. And so he told Jeff that uh, next time he came to the factory, he wanted him to bring the instrument and they were going to destroy it. So Jeff continues to gig with it and he ends up being on a, uh, a show that uh, features his band, which he had a rockabilly group and uh, that at times had uh, John Jorgensen play an upright bass and also has the Blasters and Los Lobos. And this is kind of a roots scene that kind of started in L.A. and would later on, of course, also include, you know, people like, uh, you know, Dwight Yoakam and, and Pete Anderson. Well, they're playing the show, and uh, he, he puts his equipment down and, and goes out to see the rest of the show, and guess what? The instrument gets stolen. Well, Jeff is crushed and embarrassed, and so he calls Leo Fender and tells him what's happened and tell, tells him that the instrument's gone and uh, apologizes for it. And Leo says it's okay. Well, Jeff feels embarrassed and he just kind of feels like, you know, he felt like he was kind of ugly to Leo in the past. And, uh, and then you know, the instrument got stolen after they said they wanted it back. And so he's, he's pretty embarrassed. So he kind of avoids Leo and the guys, and he just goes back to playing his regular guitar. Well, uh, fast forward a bit, and it's the NAM show, which happens in Southern California every year. And he looks at the, uh, at the trade show, you know, map to see where all the booths are, and he finds out where GNL is, and he decides to avoid it because he just doesn't want to run into this, those guys because he thinks they're going to be pissed off at him. He thinks they're going to be mad because he lost, you know, lost the instrument. Well, he ends up walking around and he ends up running into Dale Hyatt, the head of sales at uh, GNL. And uh, Dale immediately comes over and says, Hey, hey, you've got to come to the booth. You have got to come to the booth. We've got something for you. And Jeff you know, reluctantly goes with him. And of course in the booth, there's Leo and George and, and they have a black case and they open it up and there is GNL broadcaster serial number three. And so in the time that had passed, they had released the SC2 and people were still wanting a more traditional guitar. So they basically just took the SC2, everything about it, you know, they just changed the headstock shape and they changed the body shape to be like a telly. And, uh, and they you know, were releasing it as a new model. And uh, it was something, it was a compromise because Leo was able to give people a nod to the past with the body shape and kind of the, you know, not so much the headstock shape, but mainly with the body shape itself. But then he knew that he was innovating with the bridge and the pickups 
and the neck design and the uh, the three bolt neck and the the truss rod and the everything about it was there was innovation there so he was able to live with that and not feel like he was just you know completely bowing down to the desires of of players and dealers so uh you know of course we all know about the whole trademark you know issue with Gretsch and their broadcaster drum set so there were only 800 or so instruments made, and they were all apparently signed by, uh, by Leo on the inspection tag. And uh, those, of course, sold through. There was the cease and desist that, of course, happened again. I think uh, Fender even got into the fray, you know, you know saying they didn't want uh, Leo to do this. And, uh, yeah, so they, they stopped making the broadcaster, which was... a uh, uh, you know, again, it was basically an SC2, and uh, they had maple bodies, and they had uh, maple necks, and they either had a, you know, a maple, you know, they were either a one-piece maple neck, or they had a maple neck with an ebony fretboard, and they were all black. Uh, interesting thing about uh, the construction of those guitars, and they continued to do it, was that the, the maple that was used for the neck was cut in two down the middle, long ways and they flipped it and that way if the neck was going to warp the two pieces were going to fight against each other so you had one piece that would not want to warp this way and the other one's going to warp this way so you you flip flopped them and then you glued them back together and then of course depending on if you put an ebony or some type of fretboard material on there so you had that you know you had the uh kind of bullet style truss rod, which allowed you to adjust the uh, truss rod at the headstock instead of having to take the neck off. You had this cool string tree that was really simple, but it covered three strings instead of two, which you really needed by this point because people were using unwound G strings. You had uh, the three bolt you know, system that uh, was uh, badly implemented by Fender in the early 1970s because they had sloppy neck pockets and so, of course, Fender, I mean, g &L, I should say, had tight neck pockets, and so they could utilize this, and it uh, was a wonderful feature because without taking the neck off, you could also adjust the neck angle. So instead of putting a shim in there, you could just loosen these three screws, you put in a uh, Allen wrench of the proper size, and then you could raise it or lower it, and you could change the, uh, the body to neck angle. So you could... Uh, you know, have it where it angled more this way if you wanted that and do it all without uh, taking the neck off. Uh, of course, you know, the features that people think about the most on these guitars are not the, uh, <laughs> the truss rod and the, uh, and the three bolt neck. They think about the pickups and the bridge. So the bridge is wonderful. It's, it's a top loader. And I think Leo really learned his lesson from the debacle of the late 50s where top loaders were completely derided and uh, he ended up having to change back in less than a year. So what he did was he designed a bridge around top loading because, of course, the other one back in the late 50s, he just took the old you know, bent metal bridge and cut, you know, drilled holes in it. And, of course, he just had the strings being you know held in place by this little thin piece of metal well this is a honking piece of metal here and so the strings go through you know here you just string it you know through the top and you have these big fingers that have a ton of adjustment in them so you can i don't care where this bridge is i mean unless it was placed down here you could still intonate it also it has a loctite feature which you can uh Put in an Allen wrench and you can tighten this up and it pushes all of the saddles together. Also, you have not just what you see here on the surface, there is more mass underneath there. So there has to be routing done underneath here. So it doesn't just bolt on the top like a regular bridge. It's got mass underneath it. So all that mass creates a, uh, a wonderful tone and uh, a great resonance and uh, really loud acoustically and a huge a, uh, a a gigantic improvement over the top loader design of the late 50s because again this bridge was designed to be top loader from the beginning the pickups are also really wonderful um they're again kind of a compromise because 
people didn't want active pickups, but Leo wanted extended frequency range and he liked a fast attack and he didn't really want compression and such. So he used ceramic magnets and he wound them on bigger bobbins. And by doing so, he created a sound that was a little wider, kind of like a Jazzmaster pickup in a way, but it had really fast attack and it had good high end. So it kind of sounded at times, especially I find that when you put it in, in, in the two pickups together, you get a really kind of hi-fi sound that almost sounds like active pickups, but uh, is warmer and less noisy in my opinion. But these pickups are, are really great. And comparing this to a vintage Telecaster, this guitar has higher highs and lower lows and more crispness, and it just has a very unique sound. It can do the Telecaster thing, but also it just kind of has its own sound. And uh, I think this was a really amazing kind of compromise guitar where Leo was able to feel good about himself and innovate and he was also able to give the public what they wanted, a traditional styled instrument. So, uh, you know, of course, some, when they went to the ASAT, uh, which, you know, of course, you get a lot of different comments that's, you know, after Strat, after Telly, which may have been a joke in the company, but uh, officially it stands for the anti-satellite, uh, you know, system. So, you know, just like Comanche, you know, Comanche helicopters, and from that came the Comanche guitar and others. You know, most of the GNL products were named after, uh, you know, military weapons. So that is that is where the uh, the name of the ASAT came from. And at first, it was identical to the Broadcaster, just of course didn't say Broadcaster on the headstock. Then, of course, through the years, things started you know changing. You know, of course, well, here talking about this is the earliest. ASAT logo, which is in serif, and you have by Leo Fender underneath here, which of course the Fender company didn't really love that they had Fender anywhere on the headstock. Also, this guitar uh, does not have a maple body. So all the broadcasters had a soft maple body. This has an ash body, and uh, but you do have a uh, ebony fretboard. So you have a maple neck and you have an ebony fretboard and uh, you know, unstained ebony has streaking in it and you can see this has a really nice streak a brown streak right here so this is most definitely an ebony fretboard oh uh, yeah then later on you get the uh, the asat standard which had of course the black hardware and uh, black pickup covers and the black crinkle bridge and such the anodized pick guard and then you got the special which had white uh, you know, had a white pick guard and it had the chrome, uh, chromed bridge and chromed, you know, control plate and such. And then you get the signature series, which had Leo Fender's signature on a decal that was put here and such. And then of course you get Leo Fender passing away in the McLarens, uh, purchasing GNL and, uh, yeah. And you get some various variations and such, but, uh, Let's tell the story of this specific ASAT. So this is an early one. This is an 86 or an 87. And this guitar was owned by John Jorgensen. And John got it because he was introduced to Leo and the other guys by Jeff Ross. And uh, John was playing. He had, he had been signed to the Desert Rose Band. They had a record deal. And uh, they, they gave him this guitar and at first it was a backup instrument and then he started using it as his main instrument and he used it on Austin City Limits and during this time he had asked them for a Silver Sparkle ASAT and at first they said no because it's too much of a mess in the paint booth and it messes up the finishes on other guitars because those uh, big metal flakes end up in other finishes like black or white or something like that. All of a sudden it's got one metal flake that just shows up. And at first they said no, but as John continued to do well with the Desert Rose Band and appear on television quite a bit, they, uh, they made him a silver sparkle one and it replaced this one. And he used that as his main guitar throughout the rest of the 80s and up through the mid 90s until John 
uh, began working with the Fender Custom Shop and had a, uh, a Custom Shop Telecaster and also had a, uh, a couple of models that were made by uh, Fender Japan that were uh, Helicaster guitars. So um, this guitar wasn't really, uh, you know, John wasn't really using this guitar very much. And let's, let's move forward to about 2004. And at this point, I'm working with my old college buddy, Brad Paisley. And so we used to watch Austin City Limits. We had a VHS recording that we recorded off of the, the live broadcast of John playing with the Desert Rose Band on Austin City Limits playing this guitar. And we loved it. And we would watch that tape over and over and over again. And we loved it. And it's 2004. I'm working for Brad Paisley. He's had quite a few hits. He had three albums out at that point, And he had sold five million copies. And that's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of records to sell. And I got contacted by a record exec named Cindy Mabe. And Cindy Mabe had also been a classmate of Brad and I. And Cindy Mabe told me, she said, hey, we're about to have this party uh, to celebrate 5 million records sold for Brad. And I need you to know that in the past, we've given him an award that's usually, you know, that's that, that gold record. And it says so many, you know, 100,000 million, however many albums you've sold. We give it to him. He says, thanks. He puts it down and then he walks away without the award and he leaves it there. And we don't want that to happen again. And so we want him to get some, we want to get him something that he actually wants and he will appreciate. And so we want to really show him appreciation for what he's done. First thing out of my mouth, you need to contact John Jorgensen and see if he will sell you this guitar. Because I knew he wasn't playing this guitar anymore because he had replaced it with the Silver Sparkle one, which of course is a much more uh, of a stage guitar with a, you know, kind of an eye-catching appearance. So, uh, Cindy and a friend of hers at, the, uh, at Sony, they contact John and John agrees to sell them the instrument. John also agrees to be there at the party. And the party is on the stage of the Ryman here in Nashville. So there's no one in the audience. There's just a party on the stage of the Ryman. And so there's, you know, all the, all the people in Brad's organization, his manager and band, there's uh, record label people, there's lawyers, there's all those kind of, all those kind of stuff. And uh, I get there early to meet up with John and to kind of make sure that he's kind of hidden away because we want this to be a big surprise. So John is there with his wife, Dixie Gamble, and I take them backstage, you know, to one of the little backstage areas of the Ryman. And John has the guitar in the case and he, uh, he pulls the guitar out and I'm just gobsmacked seeing the guitar. And then I kind of realized the way John is dressed. John is dressed in his stage garb from the Desert Rose Band, or at least one of the outfits that I saw him wear. And so he's wearing, you know, your stereotypical nice black boots and jeans and such, but he has a Vox grill cloth smoking jacket from like the, the black grill cloth era. And he's wearing this outfit and he's got the guitar and I was like, this is really, this is really cool. So uh, Joe Galani, who was the head of Sony Nashville at that point, he, uh, he starts up the, uh, the ceremony and Brad is there and they're telling him all these, you know, they're giving him all these accolades and thank you for selling all these albums. You've done so well and you've had all these hits and yada, yada, yada. And then he says, and we have a special guest who'd like to say something. And out walks John Jorgensen in his Vox smoking jacket and holding this guitar. And Brad Paisley, I see him, his mouth hangs open and his eyes get this big. And yeah, you know, there's his guitar hero with the guitar that we've talked about for 20 years or something at that point, maybe less. And uh, he, uh, he proceeds to John. John Jordan says all these really nice things to Brad about uh, how proud he is of his success and you know, him as a songwriter and as a guitarist and such. And... Uh, a, a quick aside, while we were backstage beforehand, John asked me, should I sign the instrument? 
And I said, yes. And so I found him a, uh, a Sharpie and John wrote on the back of the headstock here, it says to Brad, I'm so happy and proud of your success with love, John Jorgensen, 2004. I mean, come on, that's cool. So John, you know, of course, presents him the guitar. You know, Brad's gobsmacked, he can't even say anything. And uh, they, they took a picture of us. And originally, I, you know, I had not planned on being in the picture at all. I mean, I thought the picture was just gonna be John and Brad. But Brad immediately said, no, 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 Zach, you gotta be in this picture too. And so, uh, so here's the picture of the three of us at the ceremony. And uh, yeah, that was a really, really special moment that I got to be a part of. And, uh, you know, and the fact that this really special guitar got to go from uh, a hero to a kind of a disciple, as it were, that was a, a, a special moment. So that was fun. All right. Well, there are a couple of people I need to thank for making this episode possible. First off is John Jorgensen, who was kind enough to uh, talk with me for a bit about this and make sure I had my, uh, my story straight. He was given this guitar by Dale Hyatt in uh, 1986. And he is the one that told me of the importance of Jeff Ross in this story. So I also need to th thank Jeff Ross who I spoke with and he told me the whole story. And of course, I love the fact that he was playing with Barbie Benton at a, at a bar. And I need to thank Brad Paisley for letting me borrow his guitar that is in a place of honor at his recording studio. So as you go up to the control room, this is in a glass case and everyone sees it as they, as they walk in, as they should. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.